greatest co-host in the world. Watsuk99. Get ready to rumble. The tag team champions of the world! The world. My brother Lee Creepat <laughs> has the best intro I have ever seen. The world! Yo, <laughs> George Fant is a barely above replacement level, pretty good left tackle. How can Compare you say that, that when he was in... top three in, in sack percentage last year for left tackles? And I think when in doubt, until you have better reason, go with the optimistic view. And our defensive line is going to be giving a lot of people some trouble. But yeah, it's got to be, I'm with you. I don't like the Nathan's fries when they're like floppy. It's got to be like done really well. It's very hard to teach six foot three and four three speed. Uh, that's very rare. The talent's there. You just got to put it together mentally. Right. To get out of To get. I'm a cheater. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on, Jets fans? I am pumped. Let's go. I was just talking Jets on another channel. And I'm realizing something. We are going to terrorize the other team's quarterback. Our defense is going to dominate like the old days. Remember when we had a great defense? It all started with my Jets fandom with the sack exchange. That's what it's going to be like. We're terrorizing the quarterbacks. We're going to be all over them with our new defensive edge, Will McDonald. Carl Lawson looking better than he's ever looked since he's joined the team. The get-off for Bryce Huff, JFM, Michael Clemens, and, of course, the big Q, Quinn and Williams. And did I even mention JJ? It's going to be dominant. And then guess what? For the first time, they're going to get to tee off because we're going to have a lead sometimes, a lot of times, because Aaron Rodgers ain't no joke. And Garrett Wilson's going to explode. And our offensive line is best. It's the best it's been since JD has gotten here. It's best, better, deeper. We are ready. Are you ready? Let's go. What is going on, Cy Thompson? Good to see you in the chat. Jets Mess Mess is in the house. Sean McAteer, the guardian of Temecula, is here. Harlan Abraham, a friendly, nice young man. Knob crap. The chef, Chef Craft, in the house, baby. Hank G is here. Tony Alexio, my buddy, Tony is here in the house. Love to see him. Peter is in the house. What's going on, Peter? I know I'm not too psyched about the Mets. Mark Reese, my teacher friend in New Jersey, is here. Our friend and new member, William Sprague, is in the house. Thank you for becoming a YouTube member. Thank you for becoming a snacker. I appreciate that. And Nathan Colgrove is here. You guys got off to an early start today. We're exploding. We got everybody here. And Jess, what's going on, my friend? Twisted is here. John Salty McNulty is here. Yes, he is. Snowball's in the house. And let's see. That's that's it for now. That's it. But you know what? You know who's not here? You know whose name I skipped in the chat? You know what time it is, right? It's time to introduce the, but let's get the music going. We haven't done this in too long. He is the hot dog eating champion of Jets YouTube content providers with 18 hot dogs eaten in 30 minutes. He ate 13 to 14 hot dogs Live on this very show, I witnessed this happen. He's willing to eat pizza. He's willing to eat cheeseburgers. 
He makes the best Italian food in the world. No, it's not Italy, Jeff. It's not. It's not. It's my co-host, the greatest co-host in the world. What two K ninety nine? What is going on, Adam? Jeremy, in honor of a true legend of the game, in honor of a true legend of sport and of entertainment and of pop culture, there's only one way that we can start this show. Uh, uh, the Jeremy, I make you uh, the humble with the camel clutch, you freaking jabroni, and, uh, and fuck the Tom Brady, and the fuck the Atlanta Braves, and their fucking tomahawk chop. Fuck the motherfuckers, I unshake. cheek. That's the most you all will hear me curse in one shot. Screw them all. Rest in peace, Cosro the Iron Sheik. Thank you for all your dot, all you did for us. Rest in peace. Uh, Rest yeah, in peace, good man. Lived a heck of a life, but uh, man, definitely left his mark. I want to give a little bit of love to the Iron Sheik, uh, who passed away today at the age of eighty-one. So rest in peace, Cos. Yes, yes. The Iron Sheik gave me years of entertainment, both as a wrestler, his mic skills but also on the Howard Stern show, um, many, many glorious, glorious visits to the Howard Stone Sh Stern shoot studio where he talked about and stayed in character. Got how to love the man. I was confused to this day. I'm not even sure if it was a character, but uh, a fuck Hulk Hogan, I killed him. And, you know, and, and one of my greatest, greatest moments watch listening to radio was when Artie Lang took the persona of the real Iron Sheik and called into the show when Iron Sheik was on the show <laughs> and Iron Sheik screaming at him, I'm going to yep. kill you if I find you, you imposter. I'm the real Iron Sheik. And Artie Lang doing his best imitation was screaming, I am the real Iron Sheik. And they were going at it back and forth. And about 30 minutes later, the Iron Sheik looks over behind the desk with Artie sitting and finally realized that it was Artie on the phone. <laughs> it's one of the great, great, great. You are definitely all the time, it's your brony. <laughs> oh, nothing but love to the Iron Sheik. Absolutely. For sure, for sure. Um, so Deshaun is new to the channel. He never imagined the Jets would be a good team. Well, you must be young, be younger than I am. He looks, there was a time. He there was a time when we were a good team. I know it's been a really long time. But there was a time where we were a good team, and it wasn't, uh, you know, for me it wasn't that long ago, but I'm an old man. But, yeah, um, I think uh, you're right, though. Um, it's been a long time, and with Aaron Rodgers um, at quarterback and the Jets' defense, it's hard to imagine them not being a good team. And what's up, Vincenzo? It's good to see you, my friend. Yeah, good to see you as well. And, you know, it, it's amazing because, you know, like we talk about, this is kind of the quiet time of the year when all there really is to do is to make random predictions and talk about, well, what could go right? What could go wrong? What's going on with this team that maybe we weren't looking at during free agency of the draft? And there are still some people, and it seems like their biggest argument for the Jets not being good, you know what that biggest argument is? It's because they're the New York Jets. Like, it freaking matters. Like, there's this one guy, like, I got to be honest with you. I subscribed to ESPN Plus a while ago because to, to watch the 30 for 30s, to watch the NHL games. But part of that is you get certain articles. The problem is some of these people who write these articles, I don't know how the hell they have a job in journalism and guys like you and I don't. You know, guys like Dom C. I mean, we can pull out we can pull out just about any jabroni, uh, you know, from the chat. We, I, I swear, even Kareem Carson or, or Jay Cole could write an article better than, say, Bill Barnwell does. Still predicting a fourth place finish for the Jets for no other real a guy who is always down on the Jets no matter what. And it's really just because they're the New York Jets and they don't have the resume. How many times do we have to realize with the NFL, it is a year-to-year -year proposition. 
football teams turn around quickly out of nowhere, whether it's for the better, whether it's for the worse. You, If you are just saying that the New York Jets are going to be a bottom of the barrel team, if they're going to be a last place team in this division, just because it's the New York Jets, it is laziness. Do a better job. Devote some time to your freaking craft. And I don't mean Robert Kraft either, but I, I saw that take this week. And, and, you know, we can be very pessimistic about the Jets and understandably so. But be pessimistic for the right reasons, for reasons that make sense. Not because the letters on their helmet are J-E-T-S. Let's get with it and let's be better than that. Hate, but hate with some intelligence for the love of God. Oh. I'll tell you Sean why, Deshaun Lattimore. Lattimore. The yeah. reason they're making a big deal out of uh, canceling minicamp is because there's no other news. And None. those guys make a living getting clicks, 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 clicks. That's how they make a living. So that's the exact reason. Um, the reality is, oh, my food is being delivered. We got pasta with tons of green cheese. I can put so much on. Mm. Oh, I pasta as well myself. I had a little, uh, I made a little, this little yeah. again with the dinner. Okay. Um, oh, it's like the spirally pasta, too. The spirally okay, pasta, can... guys. This is where I have to start carrying the show because Jeremy's going to be eating. I didn't know this was going to be part of the deal today. <laughs> but, go... <laughs> but going back to that question, no, no, it, it really, it really is real. That's the reason they're making a big deal out of it. I'm actually relieved that they canceled. Uh, um, only and I, it wasn't even the air quality, I didn't even know about the air quality. I'm just paranoid, you know, 40 plus years of Jets fandom. I just hate unnecessary injuries. I think our guys have to come to camp a week earlier, um, as do who are we playing, Cleveland yeah. in the Hall of Fame game. Yeah, I think that they have to as well. We're gonna we're getting an extra week. They're coming in earlier, an extra week to prepare for that Hall of Fame game. Um, I think that Rogers was here for the whole time, which is more OTAs than he's probably seen in the last 10 years of his career. Um, definitely the last few years, he hasn't been there for Green Bay. Um, I think they got a lot of time to talk the language. I think a lot of the guys will be studying and do what they do. I think that the, the, the finally, we're not like two years ago in 2021 20, where we're first gelling as a football team. I think that this team is starting to become – have that continuity we're adding people but there's but even with adding aaron Rodgers by having hackett there there's continuity there's continuity on the defensive side the players are getting to know each other they're bonded that's what otas are really about i think we have plenty of time in camp now i see no reason to not say you guys are coming in a week early canceling the rest of otas get the hell out of here relax rest up study the playbook get together and play, you know, whatever, because the guys like to get together and work out, do your thing. We'll see you a week early and we'll prepare for the season. And it's not a big deal at all. It, yeah. I'm not, I'm not too, uh, too freaked about this, but I have seen numerous radio shows who are talking about what a horrible mistake this is, you know, that Robert Salad doesn't know what he's doing and just on and on and on about this being a mistake. Well, you know what? We're never going to know the answer to that because if they did this extra week and let's say there was an injury, let's say we had another catastrophic, you know, summer injury like we had with Carl Lawson, like when they were doing the uh, joint training camps with, uh, with Green Bay. You know, that's the most recent example. But it seems as though almost every year the Jets have one big offseason injury, you know, what, whatever it may be. But in this case, yeah, I got no issues with them uh, holding off on that considering the earlier uh, start because, let's face it, the Hall of Fame game is still two months away. There is a long, long time to go between now and then. So, yeah, I don't have a big problem with that. But I will say this. It, to me, is going to be paramount to get off to a quick start because that first game against Buffalo is going to be big because Buffalo keeps adding and adding and adding. Cameron Dancer, a quarterback. They just entered Leonard Floyd at pass rusher. I mean, they've got Von Miller and Leonard Floyd. Now, we don't know if Miller's going to be ready. I don't think he's going to be ready for the first game. But I was thinking the Jets had an advantage at the with the pass rush position. But now that they've added Leonard Floyd, you know, Buffalo keeps adding and adding and adding. Plus, there's still the race for Dalvin Cook. 
you know, I don't expect either team to get DeAndre Hopkins. I, if he goes to Tennessee, you know what? Tennessee could have him. I personally don't want any part of Hopkins. But Dalvin Cook interests me. I've been a big Dalvin Cook fan basically since he started playing in this league. Um, I just don't know if uh, if running back is really a big area of need. I, I wonder with Dalvin Cook. If the Jets were to sign him, it's kind of with the idea of keeping him away from Buffalo and Miami. Because with what you hear, the only teams who are really looking at Dalvin Cook is the AFC yeah. East teams. Everybody except New England, which is crazy. Because, you know, I like our running back room quite a bit. I mean, if we were to add something somewhere, I mean, I would like to bring Quan Alexander back. But more importantly, I want to extend Quinn and Williams. It's not so much about adding a new piece in for me. It's about keeping what the Jets already have. That, to me, is more important. I love Dalvin Cook, but is Dalvin Cook really willing to accept a backup role once Brees Hall is back and ready to go? Now, I'm good with starting Brees Hall on the pup list, especially if this running back room is, think about it, Dalvin Cook, Michael Carter, Bam Knight, and Izzy. And if you add Nick Bodden at as your fullback, that is as deep a running back room as I can imagine. That That yeah. is pretty freaking impressive. But at the end of the day, Aaron Rodgers is the quarterback of this team, and even when you do run the ball, you can only run it with one running back at a time. So to me, if I'm Dalvin Cook, do I really see a real fit on the Jets as opposed to if I'm going to Buffalo and, you know, they've got, I think, James Cook, uh, Damian Harris, don't, Devin Singletary went away. He went to Houston. You know, Miami's got a, a bunch of really good running backs, but as far as upside goes, to me, nobody touches Brees Hall. So right. I'd be a little surprised to see Dalvin come over here, but it's somebody, it's something that would really, really interest me. And I know I kind of took it off topic from, from where you were, but the idea of Dalvin cook, it really does fascinate me. I'm just not sure that he is what the jets need at this time. What do you think about Dalvin? Yeah, I would, be, I would be shocked if they did it. Look, I wouldn't complain. I would figure there's a reason to me. It would make me really think about what they think about Brees Hall for this year. Like that would like that to me, it would mean that they're thinking it's going to be a year before he's really anything close to what he, you know, was. That's what it would tell me if we got him, because otherwise it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Only because we need the money this year because we really want to restructure Rodgers and take some of that hundred million away, right? We, like that's how, that's why I think we're building up cap space because we don't want to push the entire hundred million over the next few years. We don't even know how long he's going to stay. So I think that we want to balance out as much of that as we can. Um, also, it would be a surprise to me because if you, if you bring in De um, Cook, you're going to have to lose one of these young players. And I know a lot of people, are, My, you know, Michael Carter's not good. He's not good. I think that's an exaggeration. I think people have jumped the gun on that. I think even in the first half of the year, he was fine. He had a, a very solid rookie year. He was fine until he had no offensive line. Because if you look, it's not a coincidence that not only did he drop off, but Bam Knight dropped off, and all of a sudden we couldn't run the ball. Well, maybe that had to do with the fact that our entire offensive line was decimated and every defense started playing us like, we're going to put eight, nine guys in the box because we've realized and established the fact that you do not have a quarterback. So I'm not <laughs> giving up on the running backs we have. I think they're young. I, I wouldn't let, want to lose any of them for a one-year rental to fill in, you know, like for whatever reason they get them. That said, if they get them, I believe and I trust in JD, and I believe there's a reason why, and that they felt there was a need for a reason. So I and how can any fan not be excited if, if you were to stack Dalvin Cook on this team? And you already have Rodgers, and you already have Brees Hall, and Michael Carter, and Bam Knight, and you got Izzy, who we took, you know, from Pittsburgh, and you know, and we added Lazard, and you got Garrett Wilson and back to explode. I mean, how could you not be excited? I mean, it would be exciting because he's a great player, he's a dynamic player, but it, sh I just can't make sense of it. So it's hard for me to understand or believe that JD is very serious about it. But who knows? Maybe he's trying to get him at a good price. It, it very Maybe. well, it very well could be that, and you know, you go back to the way the defenses were playing the Jets towards the second half of last year, stacking the box. Couldn't that have been the defensive strategy going back for the last ten, eleven, or twelve years playing the Jets? Yeah. <laughs> 
That that is the exact defense. I feel like we have been talking about that forever. Where the Jets, their best offensive players are usually running backs. Whether it's been, I mean, we could go down the names. Whether it's Chris Ivory, whether it's let's hand the ball off to Frank Gore and watch him fall forward on his face for two yards, just as long as he gets his twenty thousand yards, we'll consider that a successful year. So yeah, I mean, the truth is, we haven't had a potent passing attack since I mean, twenty fifteen, the one year. But outside of that, you got to go back back to the uh, Sanchez throwing to Braylon, Santonio, Jericho, and Keller. You really have to go back to 2009, 2010. I mean, I, I go back when I do when I research these trivia questions, you know, for these shows, and I go back, I look at some of these rosters, and I I, I want to pull my hair out. I mean, from my face, my chin, my forearms. I mean, it is painful looking at some of these rosters when we look at some of the guys who are getting targets. I mean, it's excruciating. Yeah. I mean, when, when a few years from now, we're going to talk about name a random jet. We'll be talking about names like Chris Hogan. I mean, oh my goodness. I mean, some of these, yeah. some of these things that we dealt with, we, for years, we had to talk ourselves up to thinking we could be a somewhat capable offense, just a decent offense, but it was never going to be an offense that was going to contend for anything. We just wanted to not be embarrassing. That's right. what that's what our goal was to not embarrass ourselves. Mediocrity was a goal to attain. Mediocrity is now our and what, floor. And, what, and what's so amazing is that you're taught you're in a situation where we finally look like we have this potentially great offense where we could finally put up points. And it happens to be when we've had a resurgence in our defense. So the timing couldn't be better. The timing couldn't be better. If we start scoring points now and suddenly we're scoring 25 plus points a game instead of the 17 that we were scoring last year, and I think it could be more. I think we can get up into the 30, you know, area of average points per game. It's very possible. Um, it's, you know, as our defense comes out and is the same defense they were last year in that scenario, we're going to win a lot of football games. We're going to be very dangerous. So. Oh, um, Snowball says, have you, hey, seen, Snowball. "Have you seen Lawson at practice? He looks like the Hulk with the speed of the Flash. He'll lead the team in sacks this year. Don't say he can't. I definitely wouldn't say that he can't. I would say that I've noticed it about the entire defensive line. Everybody that I've seen on that defensive line, it's almost like they made a pack together to get into the best shape of their lives. Because if you look at Michael Clemens and then you look at Lawson." you start to say, holy moly, like these guys are for real. They're serious. And then Will McDonald, I know that people are saying he needs to put on a little, well, some 15 pounds of muscle or whatever, but he looks damn good to me right now. Yeah, I'd say so. Yeah, and hey, Carl Lawson, last year he had seven sacks, which was second on the team. Quinnen had, uh, Quinnen had 12. So it was Quinnen with 12, Lawson with seven, JFM with five. That was the top three. Uh, Bryce Huff had three and a half. Nobody else had more than three sacks. And it's interesting because the Jets had 45 sacks last year. Uh, that was, I think, fifth or sixth in the NFL, which is which is pretty good. But to me, there's definitely potential to be even better. I mean, the Philadelphia Eagles had, what, 75 sacks last year? There's no reason the Jets cannot do better you know, this year than they did last year. So, oh, okay. And the other thing with Lawson – you know, he said a year removed from that Achilles surgery. Sometimes that Achilles still ached when he played last year. You know, he wasn't really playing, you know, with full confidence that he couldn't re-injure himself. And sometimes that burden is mental, where you have to get through that, where you have to feel confident that you are back to your old ways. You know, and I think Lawson's there. And a lot of Jets fans and media members, understandably, were talking about the idea of cutting Carl Lawson to save that money. Well, you know what? They didn't do it. You know, they're taking the chance on him, and I think it's going to be a worthwhile uh, chance to take. I mean, our hope is that we see the Carl Lawson that we saw in practice before he went down on that field against Green Bay in that uh, in that preseason scrimmage. But, yeah, I'm definitely excited for him. Now, he has shown the ability in the in the past to generate the pressure but not necessarily finish the sack. Now, I am all for him generating the pressure because I think he has enough players around him on this defense, not just on the defensive line, but in the secondary where that could create turnovers. I mean, think about in the Pittsburgh game last year when Michael Carter II 
got that big interception off Kenny Pickett. That was because of a generated pass rush, because of a pass a pass that was rushed. Carter was able to see the play, cut the pass off, and create a turnover that turned that whole game around. If Lawson's going to do that a bunch of times this year, how could I not be there for it? Because keep in mind, for all we want to say about this defense being elite, I'm sorry, for the last two years, when you finished 31st and 29th in taking the ball away over two seasons, that is not an elite defense to me. That is a good defense. It's a capable defense. But I want a defense that not just that does, does the bend but don't break, but can break the offense. And I think they have another step up to take as far as that goes. And I want to see them do that this year. Yeah, I, I look, I think the big difference is going to be, I think, bigger than the improvement of adding McDonald, bigger than the improvement of Lawson having that extra year, the Achilles injury. These are all legitimate reasons why we're a better defensive line, not to mention that J.J. and Clemens are now in their second season and finish their rookie years, and players obviously start learning the league and get better and better typically. So there's every reason to believe and understand why this defensive line will be better than it was last year and put even more pressure on quarterbacks and get even more sacks. But I think the biggest difference and a bigger factor than even that is the fact that we're going to score points now, that there are going to be games where we have the lead. Points. And we're going to be putting in our opponents in a situation where they have to pass more in the second part of the game and like mid third quarter to the end of the game where they're going to be in shotgun more and they can't do the little dinky plays that take lots of time and long drives with small yardage, which is pretty much the only way to attack the Jets defense. That's what we're the most susceptible to is the short game, the screen passes, as we all know, and the short passes because we play the zone. I think that that weapon against us goes away when you're down by 13 points in you know in the middle and getting to the end of the third quarter and you start having to think about time and you have to start attacking the jets downfield and i think that's why you're going to start to see a lot better situations for our pass rush to go and get the quarterback yeah most most definitely and uh you know i've seen some uh some people making bold predictions i saw one bold prediction that gardner that sauce gardner would have eight interceptions this year i <laughs> i don't know if we had eight interceptions as a defense last year <laughs> okay yeah. well, so the problem is, is, yeah, is sauce gardner going to even be targeted eight times this year <laughs> no no that, i mean that, that's my that's my first thought as far as that goes but then again if the other team has to throw the ball down the field that much more then I could see a situation where that happens. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, yeah, there's so many different ways to look at this defense. It really just comes down to how optimistic versus pessimistic are you. I mean, you could say the defense had elite health last year, and they absolutely did. You And on the other hand, you could say, well, look at the defense. The offense put them in terrible situations. There were many times when the opposing team's offense would start a drive, you know, around midfield or in Jets territory and the Jets defense had to stop them to prevent them from scoring. And many times they did that. And then the other team punts and they pin the Jets inside the 20. And then our, and then our, you know, our terrible offense can't move the ball down the field, punt away. And eventually the team starts to get some field goals or whatever. They start to pull ahead. I mean, yeah, it was just, it, it's just a very frustrating rhythm watching a whole lot of a lot of Jets games where the defense was doing what they could, but ultimately, you know, I feel like Eric Mangini was the first one who talked about complimentary football, and it's it's since become very cliche, but it really is true. The offense helps the defense. The defense helps the offense. I would throw in special teams, but you know, as we go on with every year, the special teams role diminishes more and more and more. To the point where they don't even need to have a freaking kickoff return anymore. I mean, I used to wonder, you know, what's the battle going to be like for the return job? Who's going to return the kicks? Who's going to return the punts? The kick return is basically obsolete at this point. And it's a little bit of a disappointment to me uh, because that takes some of the fun, the excitement out. Because 
let's think about it. I mean, some of the best Jets teams we've seen in, in, in my lifetime, in your lifetime, anybody who's like 30, 40 up years old, you know, who remembers those 90s Jets, early 2000s Jets, the special team sometimes was the best part of the Jets. It really was when Westhoff was coaching and we had all these dynamic returners. I mean, sometimes the special teams had a better chance to score points than the offense did. You know, no, yeah. no exaggeration. And hey, Harry, good to see you, man. Good to see you. Yes, John B. Super chats do cut the line. Thanks for thank you for pointing that out. Is there a super chat? No, John B. Just wanted us to point that out again, since uh, oh, you know, okay. since we we are a, we are a poverty podcast. So yes, yeah, super chats do cut the line. We don't yeah, have any I fancy thought, umbrellas no, no. to give away or stuff like that, but we still appreciate it. <laughs> well, there'll actually be some giveaways coming up. We're gonna we're getting closer to the point where we're gonna start having those fun guests. So um, I I don't want to jinx it, but we're getting closer. There's gonna we're getting very close to. Um, there's a couple of names being thrown at me. We're going to see who comes first. All right. All right. Look forward to that. All right. So uh, let's give us some details on the pasta. Is this homemade? Is this from a restaurant? What do we got? What do we got in there right now? That's um, what everybody really wants free. to know. My wife is celiac, so the pasta is gluten free. But we uh -huh. buy a very good brand. It's very good. Um, and okay. we believe that this, I've noticed over the years that it's the sauce that makes the big difference. So we get uh, Vincent's tomato sauce chips like we ordered on Amazon. All right. Because that's the best. If you're not going to make homemade sauce, that's the best sauce that you can get in a jar. We think. Mm. It's called Vincent's. Okay. So um, it's spicy. It's yummy. And then we use a Peco Romano or whatever. You know, we do that. And we put it in a blender to grind it. And... <laughs> the Pecorino one? Romano. Yes. Pecorino <laughs> Romano. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> nice. nice. Yeah, it's I made some uh, big ziti the other night with uh, Italian sausage and eggplant. Even put a little bit of red wine in there to help reduce uh, reduce I down the that. onions. It's uh, yeah, it's a good, good, good dish. Plenty, plenty, plenty of cheese in there also. But yeah, that bakes up nice and crispy. It's a very good pasta dish. And with my appetite, eh, maybe about four servings, five servings. <laughs> Could definitely take some of that down for sure. But yeah, it hit the spot after working until eight o'clock tonight, no doubt about it. So as SI Thompson, really, let's not talk about food. You know what? We'll we could take like one minute food breaks and then we'll pull, and then we'll uh and then we'll switch it back over. But sometimes we need a little <laughs> bit of a break. But hey, Chad, yeah, if hey, you have a if you have a topic yeah. for us, if there's a question you have for us that you like us to talk about that's uh Jet related, football related, put it down there in the chat. You know, we'd be uh, more than happy to entertain your curiosity tonight, especially when there's uh, you're searching deep for OTA news to talk about. Yeah, look, so, no news is good news. That's exactly meaning, right. Meaning, the, the, you know, my fear as a Jets fan always is anytime you see a, you know, recent news alert or something and you see Jets. You're like waiting for the other shoe to drop. You're waiting for the bad news. And right now, it seems like everything is chill. Knock on wood. Everything is chill and everybody is fine. So, and not only that, but all of our injured guys that we weren't sure about all have good uh, prognosis, right? Like that, they're all predicted to be ready. I saw a video today of Brees Hall not just running. I saw Brees Hall making cuts today cuts oh yes yes connor hughes giving like five thousand jets fans a heart attack in a span of two minutes saying uh jets running back Brees hall cutting hashtag jets and pretty much half the fan base reading that thought the jets were cutting Brees hall <laughs> and oh i'm like God. connor you have to watch how you word those tweets <laughs> not that he would ever <laughs> respond to me he wouldn't but I was like, is Brees Hall cutting the Jets? Is that what happened? But it's just, yeah. But it was uh, it was definitely good to see that. Uh, no doubt about it. But again, this is not a situation where he needs to be rushed. And, you know, the fact that the Jets were thinking as long as hard as they were about, you know, bringing in a running back. I, I still could not believe that they were thinking about Jameer Gibbs with their first choice as running back. I mean, I... It seems as though that was a real consideration. I, I I don't want to believe that that was true, that they would actually target a running back that high because that tells me that they're a little bit worried about Brees' health. So, yeah. 
even though it's a very good thing to see Brees working the way he does, of course he's saying all the right things. Of course he's going to say all the right things. Hey, you know who else said all the right things last year? J.K. Dobbins. And he never really came back right. Now, not all AC inju- ACL injuries are made the same. We know this. You know, one person's recovery is not the next person's recovery. But we can't go in with the expectation that he's going to be ready to go at 100%. So that begs the question, do you trust Carter, Johnson, and Israel to carry the load between the three of them? You know, and the fact of the matter is I feel okay with it, but I think you're – by. If Brees was healthy, put it this way. If Brees was healthy, I would be starting off this offense, running it through him for the first couple of weeks while Rodgers really starts to get comfortable with these new receivers. Because I feel you can build your offense around Brees Hall. And as much as I trust Rodgers, you know, it's his first time working with a lot of these guys. And I don't just mean the receivers. I'm talking about the offensive line. So early on, when you have a lot of big games against a lot of good, good teams, you got to hit the freaking ground running. We're not starting with Houston. We're not starting with Atlanta. I wish we were, but we're not. So I think that the Jets having a good run game from the beginning is going to be a really freaking big deal. So it's going to, it's going to, it's going to really matter. And uh, if Brees isn't ready to go, then I think all the reason more to consider Dalvin Cook if you don't think that the combination of Carter, Israel, and Bam are going to be able to to carry the load for the first couple of weeks. And it's hard to know because I know Vincenzo's not a fan of of a running back room after Brees Hall. I've noticed. But I got to say again, I got to say again, if you watch the way they played, I'm not saying they're great running backs. They're not Brees Hall. To me, there's a level of running back where you're not bad, you're not great, you're good. And what that means, but when you're just good, it means you're as good as your offensive line. You're as good as the system. You're as good as the situation. So you have to understand, if you re-watch the games, for the first eight games of the year, there was nothing wrong with Michael Carter. There was nothing wrong with Bam Knight. Bam Knight, when he came in, actually did very well. Oh, yeah. The problem problem started when we were depleted. We had no blocking. They were stacking the box. So the only running back that would have a chance in this league, if you watch the last seven games of the year, the only running back that would have a chance is the elite running backs, the running backs that are so great that even with lousy blocking and box stacking, they could still find a way. And all good running backs that you see in the league that are good running backs are not the same. They, Yeah, that's what makes them backups. That's why they're RB2, RB3. That's why they're not Brees Hall. That's why they're not the starting running back because they're not good enough that if you don't block well for them and the other team is stacking the box and not respecting your quarterback, that they're going to be able to do a lot. We saw that happen. But I also saw them as very competent running backs when our offensive line was healthy and we were doing any other kind of attack where we were getting any kind of level of play that was respectable from our quarterback. We saw that, like, we watched the games. I watched a game, you know, the first game against Buffalo. Michael Carter had some huge runs. During that game, he had some great runs. So I'm just saying, it's not that they suck. They don't suck. They're just not elite running backs. They're you're like, we're going to have to, we're going to, what we need this year more than anything, not on wood, is for our offensive line to stay healthy. And we need, now we got it, a real quarterback to just play like a real quarterback. And that's going to change everything for all of our running backs. And the scariest thing is what can Brees Hall do with Aaron Rodgers and a healthy offensive line after what he did last year? Crazy. And not only that, and not only that, imagine what he could do coming out of the backfield catching pass. I mean, he was able to make some big pass plays with Zach Wilson throwing him the football. Imagine Rodgers looking yeah. for him, uh, you know, r- running down the sideline, running a flat out of the backfield. Imagine what some of the, what some of those plays could look like. So, be insane. yeah. Yeah, but you know what? Rogers likes a more simple offense, and by that I mean not a lot of motion, not a lot, not a lot of frills. 
You don't even need a whole lot of plays. It's like, here's what we have. You know, you know what we're going to do, but still you got to stop it. And he has, and here's the thing we have, I cannot remember the last time the Jets offensive line was this potentially deep. I'm not saying it's as top heavy. I'm not saying we got Nick and brick on there, but I feel like they have at least a competent backup at every single position. If you if you really if you really look at that, I mean, let's think about it. At tackle, you've got Brown, Becton, Turner, Warren, uh, Max Mitchell. That's just a tackle. Guard, you've got Tomlinson, AVT, Schweitzer, Cologne. Center, you've got McGovern. You've got Tippman. That is a ten or eleven deep offensive line. And probably not all of them are going to make the roster, you know, barring an injury. But I'll tell you what, one injury is not going to kill this offensive line. And that's what I feel good about the offense. That's one of the reasons I'm excited. Because here's the thing, when you don't have the depth, like the Jets have not had for so many years, there was so many situations where one injury could cripple the team. And there were even critics of Joe Douglas, even during last season, who said Joe Douglas didn't address the offensive line. It was laughable. That criticism to me was, it was just, it was ignorant. It wasn't even ignorant. It was ignorant. Okay. Because it just showed a complete lack. Uh, Number one, there's only so many really good offensive linemen in the league anyway, because if an offensive lineman's a backup and he has an opportunity to start, he's going to leave because it seems to be getting harder and harder to develop offensive linemen nowadays. I don't know why that is, but it seems to be a fact of life. But when you have, but I felt like there were so many even preseason games over the years where the Jets would put in their backup offensive linemen and the quarterback would get pulverized by the opposing team's defense. It was frustrating. It was infuriating to watch. And this goes back to the days of Rex, Herman. It it was absolutely terrible uh, to watch. But I got, I I have some legit faith in this offensive line. It's just a matter of plugging the right guys into the right spots. But they definitely have, but it definitely does not fall on Joe Douglas. And I I really like the addition of Keith Carter. I think he's going to really be a play a big role with developing this line. And I think there's a big reason they hired him was to develop some of these players and also be bad cop for guys like Makai Becton, who might need a good, a good kick in the ass once in a while. That's one reason I think the, uh, the hiring of Keith Carter makes so much sense. Hey Boogie. Good to see him, man. What game this season you guys are positive. The jets will win when the experts wrote off as a loss already. So I guess what he's asking is, what is the game we're positive that we're going to win that the experts are considering a loss? Yeah. Well, I, I want to start. That's by a saying, tricky one. Go ahead. I, I, well, well, first, I don't. I'm not positive about any game. Like because I just been no. watching football too long. Like like you know. So I just want to change the wording. I'm not going to sit here and say I'm positive that you're going to win any particular game. Um, just because it's football and, you know, when you start thinking like that, if the players ever start thinking like that, that's when you lose. But correct. if you want to talk about a game that I think people and experts think we're going to lose, where they're underestimating us, where I think that we're more of a favorite than people are giving us credit for, I'm going to start by saying uh, the Cowboys uh, playing in Dallas. I think that Hmm. you'll see most people are going to have them as a line favorite. You know, um, because every year the Cowboys are super, super hyped. You know, this is the year, this is the year, this is the year. Um, And I think that I believe that the Jets are the favorite to win that game. Like, I'm not terrified of that game. I think that's a very winnable game for us. I think the experts are wrong. I think that Dak Prescott's going to have a very hard time against our defense. I think we're going to do a really good job in shutting them down. Um, and I believe that Aaron Rodgers just is a whole new dynamic, you know, and yeah, Micah Parsons, they got some good guys that we're going to have to be wary of, but I think that we got, you know, I, I just think that from watching Dallas, they're inconsistent. Um, they always seem to disappoint from their expectations at the beginning of every year. They're always talking about Super Bowl, and they always seem to disappoint. And I think we're going to go in there and we're going to punch them in the face. Hmm. 
I, I, I think that's a very good scenario. And here's the thing. I think a lot of experts have the Jets winning 12 games, 13 games, something like that. There's a couple haters out there. But when a lot of these people are only predicting the Jets to lose maybe four games, five games, it, it, it kind of narrows it down. You know, Nolte, that's kind of where I was going. I really think Philly is going to be as big of a challenge this year as we're going to face. When you see yeah. the multiple quarterback when you see the pass rush when you see a lot of different weapons and an excellent offensive line that could you know potentially neutralize our pass rush you know you got a very good one-two tandem at cornerback you know to help cover those receivers you know that's gonna be that's gonna be a fight but we talked a lot last year about jinxes that the Jets were trying to overcome, and they did overcome a few things. I mean, you know, winning some games in the division, different things like that. Well, there's a couple things the Jet that I want to see the Jets do this year: beat New England for the first time, I think, since uh, since the Reagan administration. Okay, do that. <laughs> beat <laughs> beat Philly for the first time in the history of this franchise. Make the playoffs. Those three things. Without those three things, yeah, I mean, obviously New England and making the playoffs are more important than Philly. But it would just – I'm tired of every couple of years playing Philly and just having to be reminded that the Jets have never beaten them. I, I, I'm just a little bit sick of it. It's like it shouldn't bother me, but it's like can we just get that – it's like it's like a gnat. That, it's like a gnat that we can't squash or something. It keeps escaping. It's like get out of here. So yeah, it would it would be very good to to just knock that out. Um, I, I will tell you one game that I think is going to be very interesting, and that's the uh, the Charger game, uh, because you know we can talk about the Chargers. Well, they're a paper team, and whatnot. The Chargers are a darn good regular season team. They got some legitimate talent over there. You know that's going to be a, a very very interesting game. Plus, it's going to be uh, yeah, that's a that's a Monday night football game at home. And I got to tell you, I'm glad we have that game at home as opposed to on the road. I wouldn't want to be uh, playing that game indoors. So I, I think that Rodgers-Herbert matchup is going to be uh, – that's the game I don't think a lot of people are talking about, but I think it's going to be really, really interesting. Yeah. Hey, look, we have a lot of tough games. Um, and what I'm trying to focus on is, like, what I'm thinking about is – are a very good team now. Like we and we have to get used to that as Jets fans. Historically, when you look at our schedule, you could just point to a lot of these games. Oh, we're gonna lose to Buffalo. That's we're a loss. Lose Kansas City. Loss. That's we're gonna a lose loss. Eagles. That's a loss. That's a loss. So we're gonna definitely lose to Miami at least once. Oh, we can't beat the Patriots. Maybe we get lucky and win one. I mean, look, that's what we traditionally feel. That's what we think. That's what it's been like for years. But the reality is we're gonna be a lot. I, I don't think we've sometimes like you saw me at the beginning of the show i'm digesting it and realizing it saying holy shit we are that team now we're the team that people are gonna say oh shit we gotta play the jets i don't know if we can win that game but we as jeff fans gotta get used to that because it's something that we're not accustomed to no no we we haven't been in that spot in years and here's the thing even during you know the the rex era there was always the patriots when was the last time we feel like we were the team? We may not even be right now. We may not be. We're in the mix. But when was the last time that the Jets were the definitive best team just in their division? When was the last time? I mean, do we have to go all the way back to 98? Do we have to go back a whole <laughs> quarter century? We it very it very well may be. I I really think it pretty much has to be that. So we I don't know yeah. if we really know how to handle that mentally. You know, the, the most, the biggest thing that I, and I said this last year to you, I said this to green bean. I said this to other people, let's enjoy the ride right now because we are on the way up. I felt this way 12 months ago. We're on the way up. I didn't expect much. I felt the jets would be in a playoff mix until the end. I just didn't think they were going to make it uh, in the playoffs. And it turns out they were out uh, just a little bit uh, before that. Uh, what before the season basically went to hell, but you know, being a sports fan, it's about taking the ride. If the only time you're going to be happy is when your team is absolutely great, fantastic at the absolute top, you know, it's not realistic. You know, I mean, for, for crying out loud, you and I, our teams have we've seen one championship in three decades, basically. I mean, <laughs> you know, in four decades, it, it's been absolutely ridiculous. If you know. 
it's like a reflection of life. You're going to see disappointment more often than you're probably going to see success. So when you're in this position, when you can see success on the horizon, when you have a legitimate chance to get past all this adversity, all the crap, all the name calling, all the insults, all the pitying that we as Jets fans together have taken for all these years, taken every day, taken every moment, taken everything that everybody says because we have a year where we are not just full of blind hope and we have a chance to be legitimately excited that we can see a great season. And it hasn't been that way in many, many years. Take this in because it doesn't always come around. You know what, Barney? That's a very fair perspective. We are The Jets are always the underdog. And you know, the, you know what the truth is to me? I got to be honest with you, man. Just between you and me, the Jets are still kind of the underdog. You know why? They're the Jets. As long as there's still a Mahomes, there's still an Allen, there's still a Burrow, the Jets might be in the mix, but they ain't going to be nobody's favorites. Not many people's favorites. There'll be a few people f- picking it, but by no means. But you know, there's a lot of people who are thinking the Jets are going to be first, but there's a lot of people who are thinking the Jets are going to be fourth in this division. Jets got to prove it. Just got to go prove it. Yeah, I mean, look, there's no doubt at the end of the day, I have a great feeling. Someone was asking me. They was like, they were like, uh, you know, you know, I was on a channel where people were talking trash, and you know, and I and they were like, "What's your response?" I said, "Well, I don't talk trash." Like I really don't. I don't talk trash. I don't like get into it. You'll never see me on Twitter. I'll call a Miami fan like an ass when they're being an ass and well. saying you don't know what you're talking about. You're obnoxious, but that's not trash talking. I don't go on to. I don't go to Bills fans or Patriots fans or Miami fans and say we're going to beat your butt. We're going to kick your ass. We're better than you. Like I don't do that. Um, and the reason I don't do that is because I've learned over the years. Until the season starts, you don't know what you got. Yeah. Because I've seen plenty of teams yeah. with high expectations do nothing, and I've seen plenty of teams with very low expectations do a lot. The reality is I'm not going to talk trash. And just like you're saying, we haven't done anything yet. We've done nothing. So am I excited? Yes. Do I believe we have the potential to be a great team and do amazing things? Yes. Am I going to start running my mouth? And act like we've already done it? No. We've got a lot yeah. to prove. Yeah. And we have to wait for it to happen before we start trash talking or whatever. And, you know, acting like Leah you know, walking and strutting around like we're something special because we haven't done anything yet. Yeah. I, 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 for me personally, you know, I see fans of other teams go to other teams' um, Facebook pages and Twitter pages and whatnot and follow them and then respond to them. And I'm just like, why? I, I, I don't, I don't want to do that. I mean, some people try to get me in these groups. It's like fans of the AFC East. I'm like, I don't want to be engaged with a bunch of fans of the other teams in my own division. I, I, I personally don't now put it this way. If somebody, if somebody puts out a post, a dumb, a dumbass post about my team, I'll respond to them. You know, I'm not going to start the trouble, but I don't mind ending the trouble. That that that's right, pretty much right. how I that's my modus operandi. And I, won't, and I won't, and I'm not doing it with fake promises. I'm just like when someone says, uh, "The Jets, you know, Aaron Rodgers has had it. Stick a fork in him. He's no good." Jeff fans are smoking crack if they think he's still good. I'll just give them the facts. I'll say, "Really?" Because oh in the God. last three years, he's in the last three years he's had two MVP seasons. And if you watch him last year, and what you could argue is one of his worst seasons, he was still pretty damn good. Bro, yeah. I was, you know, before I came on, I decided I, I I get all these podcasts. Sometimes I get these bonus podcasts sent over to me, right? And I play this one podcast from uh, it was off the uh, the Odyssey thing. I'm not going to mention the name of the podcast, but because uh, you know, with the WFA and stuff, you get like these random podcasts that you could check out. And this one guy, he had a podcast. It was like one question for every team in the AFC East. You know what his question for the Jets was? Is Aaron Rodgers still good? Not is Aaron Rodgers still elite? Not is Aaron Rodgers still an MVP candidate? Not is Aaron Rodgers still a top quarterback? Is he good? That was the bar that this jabroni was setting. Yes, I'm I'm invoking the Iron Sheik again, and I do it with no apologies. Okay, come on. Is he still 
good. He was in an offense that he did not want to be in. He did not like working with the floors. He did not like the motion offense. He wanted to have more say in the offense, and he didn't have it. He wasn't happy there for a while. And like you said, you know, two seasons ago and three seasons ago, he was the MVP of the National Freaking Football League. So to, yeah, so to me, I'm not worried about. I got I got a bunch of other questions with this team before I question: Is Aaron Rodgers still good? Just good. It's so, please. It's, it's I'd so, sign up so, for good so, right now. It's so extreme how like people think. Ugh. It's like it's like because he's not because he didn't have the year last year, and there were reasons for it. And even if it if there weren't, then oh, he's done. Stick a fork in him. No, look at his numbers. Look how he played. Watch the games. He's still really special. And it's like, is he elite? That's a question. It's a reasonable question to say, is he still elite? Fine. You could ask that question. Is he still one of the top quarterbacks in the NFL? Ask that question. But ask this. If you're really paying attention and you know this team like we do, do the did the New York Jets need an elite quarterback last year? Or did we just need a good quarterback last year? A, a, good, a good quarterback, quarterback. W- at the very least, at the very least, a good quarterback would have had the Jets in the playoff race going into the last week of the season. No doubt about it. Yeah, well, no question about it. I mean, and that's even that's, with the offensive line kind. injuries. Yeah. yeah. Even with the yeah. offensive line injuries, I believe it. I think with because there were even in those games we were losing during that streak, our defense was keeping us in the game. We just needed something. And we just couldn't get it. We had, you know, obviously Mike White getting hurt like he always does. And I don't blame him as a person. It's not personal. I'm not angry at him. It's not his fault. He doesn't want to get hurt. We watched what Buffalo did to him. I'd be, I'd have broken ribs too if Milano came at me like that and hit me square like that. I mean, so it's not Mike White's fault. But I mean, he got he got massacred, right? And then you got Zach, who's just so inconsistent. And when he was bad, he was he was not an NFL quarterback. He, he gives the glint, yeah. At, at his at, at his worst, I would imagine that's probably what Christian Hackenberg would have looked like if he had actually stepped on the field for the Jets. Yeah, I, I, I mean, got it. Was, it, it, was that bad. it was that it was. Bad. It really against was. Seattle. Oh my God! Against Seattle, against Jacksonville, he was so uh, bad. It was so brutal. He was so brutally Look, bad. The games eventually became non-competitive. By the end of the season, the Jets were not a competitive football team. And part of me wants to blame the coaches, but on the other hand, when you see how the offensive line just got beat down, got demoralized, you know the defense was not going to win these games by themselves. The only way the Jets were going to win the games is if the defense and special teams were scoring touchdowns, and that wasn't going to happen. It, it, just, it just wasn't. And, you know, hey, Tony, we finally saw Chris Strubler. <laughs> and you know what? We saw, we saw what Chris Strubler was, Tim Tebow with a better beard. That's basically what he was. The thing, what was amazing about Strubler is he matched Zach's entire output in offense in two drives. That is damn <laughs> That is damn I mean – I mean, it's it was, you know, I mean, and we saw he's not, obviously he wasn't a very impressive passer, but I mean, it was crazy. The point was, if they would have went to Strebler, if they would have went to Strebler sooner, we may have won that game. Because It's not impossible it to say it, that. It is, it, they it, didn't it, have an answer for it. I mean, put it this way. I, th- I think the Jacksonville coach that they had, he would have been smart enough to figure out how to adjust to to what Strebler was doing, but the fact again, I still can't go back. I still can't get over that one pass that he attempted to CJ Uzama, where there was not a Jacksonville defender in the same zip code as him, yeah. and Uzama basically had to dive to make the catch, and he got tagged, and basically that you know that was down. If if he had caught the ball on the go, he would have he would have taken that ball to the house. And- but at least he saw him and threw him the ball. <laughs> I got taken <laughs> Denzel Mims is running up the field alone, uncovered, and oh. Zach is looking right at him and doesn't throw the ball. Oh, I mean, like I, that's one play of all the plays that Zach ever made, even the crazy, ridiculous one where he didn't get it out of bounds and it was intercepted. Of all the crazy plays, there's nothing to me worse than that play. If you watch it on all 22, Denzel Mims was 
wide open, and Zach Wilson, you could see his eyes, was staring right at him, and he didn't throw the ball. Now, which game was this? Who Who was this against? You have to oh, it was one memory. of those games near the end. It was one of those games near, near the, the end. This past season? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was near the end in the last four games, That one of the ones where he played. So like Detroit or Seattle, one of those teams? Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't think because I was going to say New England the second game, but I don't think it was. I think it was – it may have been Detroit. It was like one of those games. I have to ask Green Bean. I, I can remember. see it being Detroit. That I'm game sure. was just downright. That, that game was yeah. infuriating. There, there, there was a game where there was where Mims was wide open, like alone. And, and, and we talked about how many times – same thing for Elijah Moore. There were many, many times when he was running open and they would, and he wasn't getting oh. the ball. Yeah, so many so times. Ma- so many times. I know. Italy's hey. here. Hey, good to see you, man. Uh, who, I, I think who else just came by? Chiefs Live is here, too. We got uh, oh, the KC. Hey, K- Chiefs, I'm, wait, I'm waiting for some, some of that uh, Oklahoma Joe's barbecue, man. Just uh, send, it, send it to both of us. We're waiting on it. <laughs> it's good to see you. It's good to see you. Yeah, so, I mean, we, uh, you know, I mean, there, there, it, was, it, was, it was really bad. And I'm not saying, look, everybody knows I, I, like, I don't hide it. I was huge. I was the happiest guy when we drafted Zach Wilson. I believed them in him as much as anyone. And I was excited whenever he did well. But I I can't lie and say what I'm not what I'm watching is not true. Like I can't be in denial of that. I mean, he had some moments, but man, when he was bad, he was bad. It, it's and one of those bad. things. I mean, how how often are New York Jets fans like in complete agreement on anything? Just yeah. there's really only two things: a- Adam Gase being horrible, <laughs> right, and, and pretty much, and, and Zach Wilson just needing to be replaced. It, it well, really no, came down to that level. You, unless you're Jets forever, you just could not right. defend that anymore. I would say there was one percent of the Jets fan base that was Zach Truthers. Now they. See, it felt like more because they don't shut up in the chat just forever. And there was a couple of others, uh, the right. Utah Jets fan or whatever the whatever his name was, the uh, BYU Jet fan. BYU, oh was, him, yeah, uh, that was, was Zach, that that was Zach's dad, I think. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, and on Twitter it was defense wins championships. It was that like there's a few people that right. you just couldn't get it through their head, like they just couldn't seem to understand it. Um, These are people who, once Zach leaves the Jets, they'll become a fan of that team. They're Zach Wilson fans as opposed to Jets fans. Big difference. Yeah. Big difference there. Look, so. look I, do I hope that Zach could beat the odds and do the impossible and do what's very rarely done and turn it all around and, and reach his ceiling and be a great quarterback in the NFL? If it's for the Jets, hell yeah, I want that to happen. But I'm not going to lie. That doesn't happen often. No, it, it, in this case, I can't think of somebody who would have who would have taken four or five years to start putting everything together as a quarterback. It might take a, a few years, but I mean, when you have this low of a level of performance, you know, to elevate it that much, I mean, come on, it's it's one of those things you cannot count on it. Best case scenario is that Aaron Rodgers is here for about two years. And then the Jets draft somebody along the way, and they compete with Zach for a starting job. That 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 that's basically it. You, you know, Jets mess. Uh, I was a pretty. I defended Lafleur for a little while. I, I I got I gotta say that. But the more I hear about the way he was communicating with people, and the more that I and I feel like he did not use some of this personnel as well as he could, particularly tight ends. I can understand more and more why they chose to make to make a change. Put it this way, if Michael Floor is still here, is Aaron Rodgers here as quarterback? I think the answer is absolutely not. Because Aaron Rodgers did not want to be near Michael Floor's brother anymore. Why would he want to go from one LaFleur to another LaFleur? So to me, you know what? It, it, you can make certain defenses of Michael Floor. If you'd like to do that, you're more than welcome to. That's fine. But his communication level... He just wasn't ready for this job. And I wish him well with the Rams. I, I sincerely do. I hope he does well with that team. I hope he does. But he was not ready to be an OC yet. And the best thing that could happen on the floor is he uses this time as a learning experience because he just didn't do his job as well as he could have. And I'm telling you right now, if LaFleur had done 
if LaFleur had done his job well, there is no way Aaron Rodgers is quarterbacking the Jets right now. Um, I think, yeah, I, look, I think Mike LaFleur could potentially be a very good offensive coordinator. Um, potentially. He's in a great situation now. He's not calling the plays. He's with a oh, Super Bowl coach. He can yep. learn tons from this coach. But for him to come in with a rookie co- head coach – and his first opportunity is with a rookie defensive-minded head coach. You're right. He lost the locker room. He lost the locker room. He didn't know how to connect with them. He lost them. You know, and, like, it's it's, it's not – he's a young guy. And a lot of his plays are really good. He's super smart as far as the uh, playbook is concerned. Like, he designs good plays. My problem with him was definitely the locker room. He lost the players. And then, secondly – um, he just wasn't a great situational coach. Like he'd call great plays and everything would be great. And then he gets into the red zone and it's like, or he was the worst second down and five play caller in the history of the NFL. Oh yeah. Every time yeah. we made it second and three, second and four, second and five, every time we lost yards on second down, every time. It's you like know, second and three, time. second and three, let's run a reverse, right? <laughs> right. Every time, every time. The other teams must have been laughing. They're like, this guy, we're watching it on tape week after week. He never changed it up. How about on second and three, just doing what the same kind of play you call on first down? Just do a five-yard play and get the first down. You never see a quarterback never- sneak or, or, or any, anything like that. I mean, you, you just you just wouldn't you wouldn't see that. Now, was there a lack of execution? I mean, you do have to factor in the fact that some of these injuries happen. That makes it more difficult uh, for the offense to. There you go, Radio Shack. Yeah, N- next week I'm going to wear my Circuit City shirt. We'll, we'll we'll work on that one. We'll work on pulling that on. But, uh, I worked at Radio Shack when I was in grad school. Really? Okay. She, okay. She, what was it? What, uh, she said I'll do a Bay, quick side question. Caesar Bay Shazar, uh, Cesar, like the Caesar Bay Shazar. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> Bizarre. Caesar the, Bay Shazar. Bizarre. What? Whatever you know, the, the, the market, the flea market. Bizarre. Bizarre. It's a bizarre. Off, off the Belt Parkway. Uh, <laughs> Let's do a quick side about- question. Let me ask you a quick side question. What was the first job you ever had? The first job I ever had was making dough in my best friend's pizzeria. Oh, you, you, you've told us some uh, little stories about that before. Yeah. Yeah. When I was like 13, 14, he used to pick us up. Dad, you know, Godfather used to pick us up. Me and my best friend, his dad pick us up. We'd be in the basement. I learned to push dough in the pans and the oil. It was the worst job of making dough. We get your hands all gross. And my right. dad smelled surgical supplies. So my dad gave me surgical gloves. Uh, so I beat the system. I had latex gloves and did it. And, and, uh, it ended up everyone in that pizzeria, my best friend and his dad, for years, used latex gloves when they made pizza and everything so the oil wouldn't mess up their skin. So that's a whole other story. But anyway, he would pay us $5, the both of us. This was 19, you know, freaking 85. He'd pay right. us 5 bucks every time we made the dough. Sometimes we'd make the dough five times a week, and we had a cup that, you know, that used the, you know those paper cups you used to, like with the covers that used to make the marinara sauce. And like that you put marinara sauce in and we used to keep it in the ceiling of the basement. And and one day it got up to like over 200 bucks or something. It was a ton of money. Wow. What the money goes towards? I wonder. Uh, I, I'm trying to remember. I think I, I for me, I think it besides was, your, besides drugs, besides drugs. knowing me, it was either <laughs> albums at Sam Goody or sneakers, Nike. Okay. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, my first gig was working at St. Louis Bread Company, which is now Panera. This was so long ago, it was still St. Louis Bread Company because that company was based out of St. Louis, Missouri. In fact, if you go to downtown St. Louis, it's still called St. Louis Bread Company. And I was uh, I was a cashier. Uh, this was during high school days. And I remember one time, that last, this lasted about 30 days. <laughs> And I remember, so one time they asked me to scoop in these uh, cream cheeses. We had like eight, nine, ten different types of cream cheese. They wanted me to scoop them in the to-go containers, right? So this, we had three different managers. This one manager, this very uh, butch-looking lady, I mean, like crew cut, I mean, like, you know, chitting down about here pretty much. You know, Tough-looking lady. She comes up to me and says, okay, Adam, I want you to start scooping the cream cheeses in the go container. So I'm doing this for 15 minutes, and she finally comes by and sees what I'm doing. She's like, what are you doing? What are you doing? You're supposed to level the scoop before you put the cream cheese in the containers. 
She's like yelling at me in, in front of the whole store. And I yelled back, you didn't tell me how to do it. I mean, you know, and she didn't. She didn't give me instructions. She sat me down that day and said, I could have smacked you right in the face. <laughs> Am I, you're actually telling me that. Wow. wow. And, and she said, you know what? I don't think you're really good at working with people. You really need to be in accounting or something where you're not dealing with people. I'm like, you have worked with me for one shift because this woman was never there. You've worked with me one shift, maybe two, and you're becoming my freaking career counselor already? So two days later, I, uh, I was gone. I, I did not want to be there anymore. If I was going to be treated well, that way. So. And now you're showing her a look at you on YouTube, entertaining all these people. <laughs> yeah. With Although I will say the for the free pastries at the end of the night, we donate some of the homeless uh, shelters and what whatever was left, we take those home. So I did miss the free pastries. Those were pretty freaking amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. Corporate, that, it's amazing that there are radio that is. still going. Man, it was a crazy company, man. It was a crazy company. But I'll tell you, working in that location. Uh, LMB Pizza delivered there. They were close enough. Uh, uh, so we used to order LMB. We'd order a we'd order a, tr a half tray, and just eat LMB pizza. We did it all the time, and that uh, that was a great part of that job. What about Brennan and Carr? Did they, they did Brennan Carr Rolling Roaster? Did they do some deliveries also for you? No, back then the places like that didn't deliver. Remember, you know, like, and I know with DoorDash these days. Good thing back there was a Brooklyn, DoorDash. Yeah, yeah, the only places that delivered, in, like in my memory, for the most part, was uh, was pizza and Chinese food. You know, like you can that's fair. Yeah. You can deliver, and a lot of Chinese food didn't even deliver. We used to. I remember specifically that we used to go pick it up most of the time, because n n some of the little places didn't even deliver. But it, they were such neighborhood type places; it wasn't a big deal. My dad would drive two minutes, you know, down some Brooklyn streets, down our avenue, and like just one of us would run in and grab it. But um. It wasn't like that. So Brennan Carr, Roller Roaster, I didn't get to really enjoy those places until my friends were driving. Gotcha. The first of my friends got a car. And then we were able to start going to those places. And uh, Brennan Carr, we didn't go to that much. It was hard to get in, wait for a table. It's a little more pricey for poor high school and college kids. Um, but Roller Roaster was a was a big, you know. We used to hit that yeah, I did. Yeah, my dad would take me to Roll and Roaster, like when we, because we lived in New Jersey. My grandparents lived in Brooklyn. He grew up in Brooklyn, so once in a while he'd take me over there. But yeah, we never went to Brennan and Carr. I still have not been there yet. So hopefully one day, but yeah, it just hasn't happened yet. But yeah, I definitely remember. Uh, yeah, so the and the funny thing is, you know, we loved Roll and Roaster, and the whole gimmick is putting cheese like on everything, the fries, the sandwiches. My dad's lactose intolerant. So he couldn't do the cheese. <laughs> so it was a little bit weird that he would take me over there, but we pretty much raid the pickle bar. Like we would take like that, that whole tray with the pickles, like half of it would be gone because of us. Cause we would just run right through the pickles. Hey David, good to see you, man. I think, Hey, yeah, thanks, thanks for stopping by. I, yeah. I don't think LMB is cash only anymore. When we went, I think I paid with credit. I don't card. think so. No, no, it's not. I don't think it's cash only. Yeah. Yeah. I think I paid with credit card. I, I, I mean, I, Green Bean got the pizza. I went on a different line. Like when yeah, we you got, got your the, veal you know, cutlet. I went, I went to the restaurant counter and got, you know, the outdoor counter and got an egg, uh, veal cutlet Parmesan hero. It was so funny because Green Bean was walking by me. He saw me on that line. He knows me. He knows I'm a foodie. And he's like, what are you up to? Like, how come you're not getting on the pizza line? And I said, I'm getting the veal cutlet Parmesan hero. And I said, and I'll find, and I said, and, I'm, and I'll be looking for a partner. And he and right away he said I'm in, and I said okay. So he, I ripped the, you know the hero's cut in half. He gets half the hero. I get two square slices and half of the, you know, cut. I mean it was a great deal for both of us. We both got to enjoy the you know both. Definitely, yeah, definitely. And like I told you, I'm going to be in Philadelphia in about two weeks. I'm taking a, a weekend up in Philadelphia. Uh, this has been planned for a little bit, and I'm planning out uh, my many many food adventures. But I got to tell you, there's quite a few restaurants that I'm looking at that are cash only. And, and it's pretty crazy because, you know, a lot of places you go to Saves or arenas and you can't use cash anymore. It's like cash free. And there's other restaurants where if you use cash, they might give you a little bit of a discount. It, it's pretty crazy how it works. But, yeah, when I take the train from uh, from Virginia up to Philadelphia, I got to make sure I got a few uh, a few uh, Thomas Jefferson's in my pocket there. So. Yeah, the the best pizza in Philadelphia, in my opinion, is Angelo's. 
and you need <laughs> cash. Here's the part. Here's the thing with Angelo. So I've got them on my list, but I'm thinking about getting them for like a hoagie, like a sandwich. Because I think with the pizza, you can't get like a slice. You got to get like a huge square pizza. You gotta get That's the problem. It's just me. I can't do that. So not unless oh, no. I, I'd have to beg outside. We'll, what, for one slice, please. I'll hold like a cardboard sign. One slice for Watch UK 99. You just <laughs> make sure you go to the, you make sure you go to the terminal market. Right across the oh. street from the convention center, and you go Dude. to the back. You go to the back, Dude. and you find those Amish people who make those pretzels. Oh my God, they're so good! Miller's tw- Miller's twist. Dude, is it Miller's? Pretzels. I think Dude, so. Yeah. My my hotel is one block away from the Reading Terminal Market, and that was not by accident. I can assure you. Dude, those pretzels are like freaking <laughs> heaven. Do you know what's right next door to my hotel? This is dangerous. You know, it's literally next door to my hotel and open till two in the morning. Bon Chan yeah. Korean fried chicken. That mm. is dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine a 130 Korean fried chicken craving? Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's going to be a day. I, I don't know if I'm going to video this. Like, I don't know what I'm going to put on my channel uh, because I'm going there for Mets Phillies. Uh, God knows that what that's going to be like, but uh, hopefully I'll survive. But I got to do some video stuff on this. I just don't – I'm wondering what I'm going to do. But, yeah, I got so many food destinations in mind, man. I'm so excited. I really, yeah. I really, really am. And, and, uh, David asked if we've had Grimaldi's. I've had Grimaldi's a couple yes. of times. I got to tell you, I really like it. I like the coal fire pizza a lot. It's, Grimaldi's is good. Love the, good stuff. love the coal fire pizza. I love yeah. the coal fire pizza that's in New Haven, though. I love the way they do it. I really <sighs> do. I prefer that. Like Sally's a pizza. I, I – She's so good, so good. That'll be September for me. End of September, I'm heading up that way. I'm going to be, uh, I'm going up there for my college reunion up in uh, Boston. It'll be, you know, you know what the timing of this is, right? I'm going up there the last weekend of September, one weekend after Jets versus Patriots. <laughs> this is going to be a very because everyone knows what a big Jet fan I am, right? So it's going to be an interesting dynamic spending a couple of days up in the Boston area. I have not set foot in the Boston area since 2004 uh i like southern new england i like connecticut i like rhode island providence and newport are both really good towns i like both especially if you want some good italian food go to providence and go to federal hill you will find some great great places but boston to me has been like forbidden territory but i'm planning on uh on heading up and uh yeah i expect that to be a uh, very it'll be very very interesting and it sure as hell better be coming off a jets victory that's all i can tell you <laughs> so dff1234 says what chance one to 100 do we have of making the super bowl 10 percent or higher okay uh well Our i'm gonna say i think we have i think that we are one of eight teams i think that the top two teams have a little bit better chance. So right away, you're talking about around 12% and a little bit less. I'd say 10% is a good estimate. Like I, I'm kind of, I kind of feel like 10%. You know, if we were in the NFC, <laughs> oh, gosh. a little bit, a little bit that, that higher. But I, I would say 10%. I would say 10% is is realistic. It's reasonable to say 10%. I think there's a chance after the first six games. We're gonna be like, holy shit, we're the favorite. Like Is I think it could happen. Yeah. Like I think we might come out and blow people away. I think we might be putting up 30 plus points, dominating on deep. There's a chance we're going to be spectacular. But but right now, without seeing anything, without proving it, I'm gonna I'll sit there and I'll say around 10%. Let's break this down. Uh, why don't we do this? Why don't we go through each AFC team and say ch- realistic ch- chance to make the Super Bowl? Not a realistic chance. So like yes or no, just realistic Super Bowl contender. Let, okay. Let's let's just roll right through it. Let's let's start. Let's go with each division. Buffalo, we would agree. Yes. Fair to say. Yeah. Okay. Jets, realistic chance of making the Super Bowl. I think we could say yes too. Say yes. I would say yes. Okay. Miami. Oh, yeah, yeah, what yeah, do yeah, you? Yeah, th- yeah. Okay. What would you say about Miami? No, I mean, I, okay. We, it, is there a chance? Yes. A realistic mm-hmm. chance, like the, one of the top eight teams, or like, would it not be shocking? It would be shocking. I mean, they're, yeah. I mean, I have no problem seeing, seeing Miami as a playoff team. 
but I don't see them as a threat to be a Super Bowl team. Not not without not with two a quarterback, uh, yeah. you know, who's a tackle away from being concussed. And yeah, you know, I like Vic Fangio being added on their defense. Yeah. I think their defense will take a step up, but I, I just don't know if the offense has enough. Um, as as great as they are, they have the best one two punch receiver, Tua. but I don't trust Tua. I don't trust Tua. I don't trust the running game. Look, I think they're going to be very good. I think they're going to be very dangerous. I'm not taking them lightly, but I don't see them as a Super Bowl team. No, I think they could win a playoff game, but uh, yeah, I think they could get yeah, to yeah, maybe yeah. the divisional round. I could, I could say New England. I would say no. Would no. we agree on that? Okay, so that's no two one. teams. All right, no all right. Let's go to the north. Uh, so Baltimore, realistic chance. Mm, yeah tough one yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna I, I feel no. like you can I feel like you can never count Baltimore. out Baltimore I think yeah, that's what I, makes Baltimore every year they put themselves in a position where they have a chance I I, I think so too and I, uh, to be honest with you I got too much respect for John Harbaugh I, I would take him above just about any other coach in the NFL uh, that's how much I yeah. respect the guy if Lamar, if Lamar Jackson stays healthy and you know, and you know, on any given year, their defense could be a top five defense. So, yep. And they've added some weapons this year. I mean, I think I think they got Jalen Hyatt at wide, wide receiver. No, I don't think they, they didn't get Hyatt. They got Zay Flowers a wide receiver, which uh, okay. I thought was a, a great move by them. Uh, Cincinnati, obvious, obvious contender, no, no doubt about that. Cleveland. Uh, now you have Deshaun Watson in on his first year. I think they could maybe be a contender, but I can I can't. Could see them as a team that could legitimately make it to the Super Bowl. Not yet. I don't. I just don't see them jumping over teams like Kansas City and Cincinnati and Buffalo. And us, okay. we'll leave Agreed. us out of it for the time being. Yeah. Okay. Agreed. How about Pittsburgh? Now they had a heck of a draft. They had brought in some really good players, and you know, with Mike Tomlin, that there's a thing they're always going to finish above 500. A big thing is what is Kenny Pickett going to be? But I think I don't know if Tennessee, if Pittsburgh has the best players at the most important positions, but I think they have elite players at the positions that aren't most important. If that makes sense, I think Pittsburgh's going to be a pretty formidable team, and I'm glad they're not on our schedule this year. What do you think about Pittsburgh? No, I, I agree. I, look, I think the Pittsburgh, I I expect them to be a playoff team. They're going to find a way in. Um, because of the co great coach, great system. Um, I think that if you ask me in the next three years, is it realistic Pittsburgh goes to the Super Bowl? I'd say absolutely 100%. I don't think that next okay. year, I don't think this season is their season. I think watch out for them the season after that and the season after that. Watch out for them after. This is going to be their gelling season, you know, where they're kind of putting together the, you know, this new, this new direction. Like, what you know, it's kind of like that, win while you're rebuilding Seattle Seahawk kind of thing. But I think that it's going to come together this year. They're going to surprise people. They're going to be very good. They're probably going to make the playoffs. They're losing the playoffs. I don't see them being a Super Bowl team. But then after that, they're going to be very formidable. Like they might be within the next few years a Super Bowl winner for sure. Hey, David, have a good night. Thanks for stopping by. We, we appreciate it. Hey, yeah, their day. their season this year might be what ours was last year to, to make to make the comparison. Okay, so that's four teams so far, Buffalo, Jets, Cincy, Baltimore. In the South, I mean, is there any team really that uh, – I mean, Indianapolis and Houston are, are obvious no's. I think it's fair to say that. I think Jacksonville. <sighs> Jacksonville I, I is Jacksonville. probably going to win this division by default. You've got to think. I, I think because of their division and the fact that they go in as division, probably – I'm not going to say puts them at the level of Buffalo and Cincinnati and Kansas City. But, but I will say because of their situation, like they're going to go in as a division winner, I think. So it's they're a situation have a little, where they – yeah, I, I, yeah. I say they have a slightly better chance than Miami and Pittsburgh – they have a slightly better chance than them because of their situation, but I'm still not going to put them in that category of, do I see them in the Super Bowl yet? Yeah, I could very easily see a first round playoff match of Jacksonville hosting um, a Baltimore or whoever that first team in the AFC East is. I mean, the one thing you have to keep in mind with the AFC East, it's so good. These teams are going to beat up on one another, plus they're playing the NFC East. Well, I think there might be two wild cards from the AFC East. I think it might be the lower wild cards as opposed to the top wild card. That That's my initial thought uh, as far as that goes. All right, so Jacksonville, yeah. Uh, Tennessee, I think, is 
I think Tennessee's on the way down. I I just don't believe in that team anymore. I, I'm sorry, I don't at this point. No, did, so then in the West, yeah, they did a horrendously stupid thing. They yeah, wiped out the offensive line and the coach, and that was the whole strength of their team. They did. Okay, and then in the West, so we know Kansas City is an obvious yes. So that brings it up to us. Are we counting Jacksonville on this list or no? I mean, as far as a legitimate contest, I'm not I feel like they're that. going to be in. I feel like I got to. I feel like I have to because I'm really – I got a good feeling they're going to be in. And uh, Calvin Ridley, I think, might be that weapon Trevor Lawrence needs. I got to be honest with you. I'm going to put them not there with Kansas City, Buffalo, and Cincy, but the next level down. I think they could at least make the divisional round and, if everything goes right, make a Cinderella run. I got yeah, I, I mean, I have, them there. I have them slightly above the Steelers in Miami. So, and those are I'm going to do it. Know, Miami's a real t- a real team that might you know that might surprise okay. people. I-, I will just say with Jacksonville, we'll just say that yes, there's a chance that they will, but it would be very surprising. It would be surprising. Okay, that's fine. So let's just call it five for right now. All right, Kansas City is an obvious yes. That's six teams. Then you've got three kind of weird teams. You got Denver, San Diego. I'm always I'm still calling them San Diego. I don't care. Uh, Denver, San Diego, and the Raiders. Now. Of those teams, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I, I'm not feeling very uh, – yeah, the Raiders, yeah, we'll, we'll leave them aside for right now. San Diego and Denver. Denver to me is – who's co- – uh, yeah, so Denver brought in Sean Payton. I think the big – and, of course, you have Mike Westhoff assisting on special teams. If special teams still mattered, I think that would actually concern me. But the big thing is what will Russell Wilson do? Can he have something of a bounce back season? Even if he does, I think Denver at best case scenario is an outskirts wildcard team. San Diego, my God, if you switch coaches in San Diego and Denver, I think San Diego would give Kansas City a run for their money for the division. I feel like San Diego has the pieces. I just don't think they have the coaching. I can't believe that coaches like Sean. I can't believe that somehow with the talents and the team that San Diego has built and with Sean Payton's availability, they didn't find a way to make that happen. I mean, it's yeah. absolutely ludicrous. Uh, San Diego is the biggest underperformer in the last two years of any team in the NFL, in my opinion. I yeah. can't believe how, how much they're underperforming based on the, the roster that they have. They're kind of like what Atlanta used to be. Years. Yeah, they're like what the Falcons yeah. were for so many years. I feel like that's where the, – but the Chargers always seem to have this little bit of a paper team stigma attached to them. you know. And I think that this last game, this last playoff game, it forced it uh, more than ever. It's like, you know, they could – they're a good bully team. They'll beat up on a bad team, but when, the t- when it really comes down to it, can they beat the best? And that's one reason why I think this that game against the Jets is going to be so, so big. I think that's going to be one of those games that separate a legitimate division contender from a team that's going to be fighting for a wild card spot. I, I think that's a game we're going to look back on in retrospect down the road, and that, that game is going to turn out to be pretty pivotal one way or another. I really, really do. So when we say Denver's the uh, Kansas City is the only uh, legitimate Super Bowl contender, or can we put the Chargers there or not really? I don't know if I can. I I, I kind of put the Chargers with Miami and Pittsburgh. I feel like there's like four to five legitimate contenders, and then there's about another five or six that are kind of like bubbling under the surface. That's got, yeah, I, I think that's kind of what I'll, I'll tell you. I'll give it five. Buffalo, the Jets. Cincinnati, Baltimore, Kansas City. I'm going to put those five above the rest. Then I would do something like uh, Miami, the Chargers, Jacksonville. And Pittsburgh. then Pittsburgh. Yeah, definitely Pittsburgh. And I I feel like Cleveland and – yeah, it seems like Cle- Cleveland and Denver are kind of like just bubbling right under there. One of them might jump up if everything goes right. That's kind of how yeah. I'm feeling right now. I mean, I felt last year that the Jets were realistically the. It was like you can make there you can make an argument that any one of those teams could make the playoffs except the Jets, and maybe you know back then, going into last season, and now I feel like it's kind of fallen off a little bit. Good as the AFC, it still is. It's not last year. I thought Indianapolis would dominate the AFC South. I will admit that I was dead wrong about it. I'll call myself out on it. I thought they would kill that division. 
and they were as underachieving as a team as there was uh, in, in that conference. So, yeah, I, I don't think that the conference is as deep as it was before, but I think it's become more top heavy than it was last season. That's how I'd say it. It's really hard to imagine that Miami head coach ever hoisting up a Lombardi trophy. I mean, it's, it's freaking Tigo. You know I mean, they got Tigo coaching them. I mean, it's well, like, <laughs> they wish they had Tigo coaching them. <laughs> they got this little runny Tigo guy. Right <laughs> Can you imagine those Tigo speeches, like him breaking down film? Oh my gosh. Can you imagine <laughs> him trying to keep the attention of, of like Joey Bosa? Oh my God. <laughs> I'd love to be oh, a fly on the wall in that meeting room. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, yeah, I think that's that pretty sums up the AFC, right? I think so too. Yeah, I, I think that's kind of a good feeling where we are right now. Uh, boy, so we, and we still have uh, it, it's still three months to go till opening day, and uh, who knows what's going to happen between now and then. Um, do you have any plans to? Uh, so right now, as far as going to a game, you're planning on uh, on Vegas at this point. Is that still in the works? Yeah, as far but as I would like. To, I'm, I'm waiting on Green Bean, like whichever game they end up going to. Yeah, um, I'm gonna try really hard to go. I'm gonna try really hard. I mean, I might have to get some booty flight or something, or use miles that I have built up from. You know, I got. I'll figure. Try to figure out a way. But like, I'm really. Uh, like, I think they're 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 talking about a couple of pot potential games. But you know, I mean, I got a free place to stay in Staten Island, with my friend. It's five minutes from Green Bean's family where he stays, which takes care of transportation, getting to the stadium. For me, it's just the flight. You know, so right, and for it. me, it's almost like the opposite. I mean, back in the day, I had a friend I stayed with in the Bronx up in uh, Pelham Bay, who I always used to stay with, but uh, but that uh, that eventually ended. But for me, I've got the travel benefits, so that works out well for me. It's really the uh, the hotel situation and uh, and figuring out where I'm going to stay. But it's harder to plan it now than it used to be because we got all these night games. It it just makes it way yeah. more difficult. I mean. One thing with the travel is part of me is like, well, Black Friday be cool. The problem is it's Thanksgiving and everybody's traveling, you know, during that time. So, uh, exactly. so it, it makes it challenging. I mean, I even have a friend in South Dakota who I could go see, uh, which isn't, which is relatively close to Denver, all things considered. So, yeah, I mean, as far as going to a game this year, I really don't know uh, how it's all going to go because let's be honest, the Jets are a hot ticket. You ain't getting, you ain't getting a road Jets game for like twenty bucks. Most likely, unless it's like yeah. at the very end of the season and the team is completely out of it. So yeah, yeah it's yeah. it's an investment to get into a game now, no doubt about it. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, but that, but you know what? Yeah. That's what we kind of want. That's that's part of the drawbacks of being a team that is in the spotlight. That's just part part of the the lumps that we got to take, guys. Yeah. Hey, maybe the Patriots will be out of it week 18 and the Jets will have a game to win the division. Maybe maybe we'll have that and we'll just like take over Gillette Stadium. How about that? <laughs> maybe that's maybe that's what we should do. We got we gotta do like a Gillette takeover when the Patriots are completely out of it and the Jets can clinch the AFC East in Foxborough. How sweet would that be? Oh that'd be awesome. Man. Dude, I'm at the point I boycott Gillette products. I refuse to use any Gillette products like razors, shaving cream for that very reason because that name is on the Patriots Stadium. I don't know about you, but that's like the one product boy. I, I will not buy Gillette for that very reason. So, <laughs> and I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one. So, no, definitely not. All right. Uh, I think we got to wrap it up. All right. Um, I, uh, what, what do you got going on, man? You know what? Uh, been doing a, most of the videos lately have been uh, baseball related uh, as of uh, a, a, as of recent uh, as of recent times. You know, it's like I say, when there's something we're talking about, I'll do it. I'm, I was actually thinking about maybe doing some wrestling stuff because you know, with the dark side of the ring uh, shows, those are always pretty good on the Vice Network. And it's always something worth reacting to because those guys do tell pretty good stories. So I'm thinking about maybe uh maybe doing a reaction video to those series every Tuesday. Maybe I'll start doing that. Uh, they just did one on Magnum TA. So uh, I might, I might do that. Uh, but as of right now, I have been working on some new graphic designs for some of my uh, football videos with game previews and, and different stuff like that. So I'm pretty excited about some of the new uh, things that I'll be uh, 
rolling out over the next couple of months. But uh, hey, check it out, NY Sports Wicker Media, and uh, man, we definitely appreciate everybody who uh, supports our channels. Thank you guys, and uh, man, look forward to seeing you next week and down the road. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Adam. Thank you, everybody um, who stayed with us tonight. We appreciate it. Um, it wouldn't be fun without you. Uh, pretty much sneering the show. I know it's a slow part of the year. Things will pick up. We'll have tons more to talk about. Right now, we're just kind of just trying to keep it, you know, the hangout alive right now. It's not that there's anything so critical to talk about, but it just, you know, I, I started this platform initially the initial idea was just a place to hang out at the very least like you come into the chat and it was a place we could all talk you guys hang out with each other um that's what i used to love to do when i watched the other channels i still love to do it um so i appreciate you guys being here and doing that and uh have an amazing week and uh, we'll see you sunday night take care everyone Don't not be tip it up. And here it comes, it's about to come in. Oh my God, they didn't. They took Sauce Gardner. Oh my God, they don't want an edge. Maybe he likes Jermaine Johnson at 10, then we're not gonna get a wide receiver. Garrett Wilson, wide receiver. Oh my God, no edge. Who is sitting there? The Jets traded up. The Jets traded up. Are we taking JJ? Are we taking JJ? Because I know Braden is in New Zealand saying, we should get Lily, Mike. He's definitely saying that. JJ! We got Johnson! We got Johnson at 26! We got Johnson at 26! This is great! <laughs> yes! They took lots of recruiting. They didn't take Dean. We traded up. We can get the Kobe Dean. We can get the Kobe Dean. It really is. They took Brees Hall. They took Brees Hall. Wow, I mean, look, I love Brees Hall. I... But there's also Jeremy Ruckert, who I think is the best tight end in the class, personally. They took Jeremy Ruckert! They took Jeremy Ruckert! Yes! We got a Jeremy! We got a Jeremy! Oh, and the Jets pick, and it's Max Mitchell. Offensive tackle. We needed that. That's... Uh, wow. We took Michael Clemens. I never heard of him. A defensive edge.